Okay, so this is going to be Deirdre's, what are we calling it? Questions and Observations by Deirdre. <laughs> Welcome. So Anybody who's not able to stay and watch this, this is going to be fun. So you're oh, up, Deirdre. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about, um, a few months ago, and occasionally it comes up, uh, Tamberly brought it up earlier today, um, we talk about specifically like in Europe, the cemeteries that recycle plots um, because that's not something we do here in the United States. And um, this is, I'm tying this in because um, Tamerly just did her talk on monuments, headstones, plaques, and we know we can get a lot of information that way, but yeah, we can, there are ways we, can't when things are recycled. So, Deirdre, so do you have any idea what happens to to headstones or grave markers when they re do recycle? As a matter of fact, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. I mean, I, I suppose it's different for yeah. different countries, but I know in in places in Switzerland, you can get the the headstone back. Um, sometimes they just break it up and use it like gravel yeah um and then they actually there is a place that has a headstone like a museum um, mm -hmm. art where i guess they're set up where you can see different types and stuff but there's no bodies you know i mean it's a headstone museum like i know this is how we go down rabbit hole what do they do with the bodies do you know i do know <laughs> oh yeah okay so disclaimer just interrupt me if it gets too gruesome but um i our group doesn't seem to be yeah. squeamish Go for it okay so um the practice of exhuming old bones sometimes it's called raising the bones may be unfamiliar to many uh it was unfamiliar to me was it unfamiliar? I mean, this, no, because you don't know Tamberley, right? I mean, you were not being facetious. Well, the only thing I can think of is I know there's a, there's a church in Portugal, in Ever Portugal, where the monks went and exhumed the bones of prior monks. And the whole inside of the church is all covered in um, vertebrae and um, sacrums. Like I think we photos. can find a photo of that. Yeah. <laughs> in a few moments. Have you been there? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I am going to start about off with the Portuguese um, who have friends and family um, that um, that rest in particularly sought after cemeteries and the current form of practice was that they do today was introduced in 1962 which really is not that long ago we were all born um, to fight the growing lack of room in century-old municipal cemeteries but the reuse of burial space predates far before that time so before the widespread advent of cemeteries in the late 1800s, the Portuguese had buried most of their dead in churchyards. So right there to me, that was of interest because I don't know, I never thought about the difference between a municipal cemetery and a church cemetery. Well, consecrated ground and non-consecrated ground too. Yeah, I mean, cause like in Salinas we've got Queen of Heaven, that's a Catholic cemetery. And then was it the Odd Fellows, the Garden of Memories? Yeah. Is that considered a municipal though? I think so. Mm, okay. So yeah, so anyway, this, I, I mean, I could have gone a thousand different directions. I mean, in this, my topic just brought up a million things. And now I'm curious, cause I know King City has a municipal cemetery but maybe it is run by Odd Fellows too. I don't even know what Odd Fellows is. I mean, that it's organization. A fraternal organization. Right. Maybe that's just their job is, is cemeteries, burying the dead. 
for odd mm -hmm. fellows. So, but back to the what Tamerly was saying. What do you? What did they do with the bone? You okay? You have yeah. A word for it. I, I yes, there's a word. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay. So before the late 1800s, they most Portuguese were buried in churchyards always with the implicit understanding that when the time came to bury the new, the old would be brought up and moved into a common ossuary. So oh, okay. yeah. ossuary is anything from a small box to a large building that contains human bones. Yeah. A body is placed in a temporary grave and then sometime later, the bones are removed, cleaned and placed in the ossuary, the final like in place. Lourdes, right, in France, Lords in France would have that. Or it's just a stacks of bones. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So in many instances, ossuaries were created as a solution to the lack of space in local cemeteries. But however, some came about when human remains were uncovered during the excavation of cemeteries, whether known or forgotten, because many times churches were expanded and the dead were right next to it. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, well, I can think of Mission San Antonio. The yeah, cemetery yeah. is like right there if you if they were to have ever expanded. San Juan Batista, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So ossuaries can range from complex underground crypts to simple boxes, and they play a vital role in several world religions which practice exhumation of bodies after burial. I didn't know religion had anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. um, and many countries have ossuaries that people can visit and will visit virtually some of them. Um, and they have architectural features made from bone, including chandeliers, wall decorations, flooring. And um, so crypts are one kind of ossuary. Um, and while the idea of an ossuary makes some individuals squeamish, you don't look green. Ossuaries <laughs> have been a part of human life for thousands of years. Some early humans exhumed and moved their dead after a set period of time um, elapsed. The construction of solid crypt-like ossuaries has been carried on for centuries with several fine examples around Europe. So, um, so okay, so back to Portugal. Um, now they have a current form of grave recycling where perpetual plots may still be purchased oh. as any other form of real estate, but temporary plots may only be occupied for three to five years. Three Once to five. Yeah. And sometimes they have to put them back in because it's not just bones. Well, with <laughs> our burial practices, I mean, I can see when you actually used to bury some somebody in a box, but ours where, you know, people get pumped full of chemicals and then they're in a sealed coffin in a sealed cement box. Three years is not long. Three to five years. We well, were disgusting. pumping them with chemicals back in the yeah. day. No, but she's saying current practice in Portugal. So I wonder they must. They probably don't. Do they use. Maybe they don't embalm. Do they embalm there? I don't know. Uh, you know. I didn't look at each country because I yeah. it, it, I think it, it's going to be different, but Three you're right. Five. In California, you don't even go in a wooden box in the soil. It's, no, you have to go in a cement, cement line. Yeah. yeah. Really? I didn't know that. It's so in environmentally horrible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, once the lease is up, bones rem remains may be transferred to one of the niches that line the walls of the cemetery, which seems ridiculous. Why even bury them if you're just gonna put them in a niche? I, well, well, because they're not small yet. You gotta put them in smaller when they're, yeah. a little <laughs> bread box. But why, why couldn't they just cremate them? Because well, some cultures don't believe in cremation. Yeah, Greece doesn't even have a crematorium. Yeah, I would believe that. The Greek cemeteries are wild. Oh, <laughs> really? How wild are they, Tamberly? Let's hear. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, just and photos. What about your days in Greek cemeteries? <laughs> wild, wild. And it, may, it makes our minds wander. Like, does she go to cemeteries nothing, all over the world? And nothing like, like 
grinding up for fertilizer or anything, huh? <laughs> no, they did not say that anywhere. Corn meal, right? Yeah. Oh, or, yeah. Jello. <laughs> So and then they can store them as ashes of columbarium. Families are expected to make the decision. But then, of course, you know, I saw some people written in, well, what if you can't find the family? You know, they and they were referring to their family, you know, had come to America. And then it was like they didn't know anything about these practices. Their family members never went back. They never paid. So you're like unclaimed luggage. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's a real problem if you think about it, because you're, you know, expanding number of people, limited amount of space, what, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So more and more European countries are being forced to adopt similar strategies against a harrowing lack of burial space. Sorry, I cut and pasted. Okay. So in Greece, burial plots are also rented for a three-year period with yearly extensions available at increasingly prohibitive prices. Wow. Um, other countries have extended their leases to last at least a decade. I'm sure it's another problem with the decomposition issue. So with the Netherlands leasing plots to 10 to 20 years, Switzerland, Sweden for 25, Italy for 10 to 30, and Germany for 15 to 30. France, like Portugal, still allows for the per purchase of perpetual plots, but there are also temporary leases lasting for 10, 30, and 50 years. Um, in the UK, where the city of London Cemetery has taken to reusing graves that haven't been touched in 75 years. I'm sure it's a big problem trying to find people. Um, my parents, yeah. Um, kind of are on a advisory, I don't know, with the, the old Calvary yeah. one off of Market Street. Yeah. And it's very hard to find relatives. Yeah. You know? I so, mean, one thing if you have to pay an annual fee, then at least you've got an annual relationship. Right. But if, if you just pay something that's good for 20 years, how are you going to find somebody? Yeah. Yeah. So um, to this end, many cemeteries routinely employ what the UK has come to call lift and deepen. Is this what they do in Greece maybe? A practice where the old remains are temporarily removed to allow for the grave to be deepened and then they're placed on the bottom while the new bodies are placed on top. Other cemeteries will remove old remains into a mass grave or common ossuary Others will box the remains before placing them in an alternative area of the cemetery, such as a wall niche. In many cases, exhumed remains are simply cremated and returned to families who may do with them what they please. I mean, even a wall niche becomes a, a problem after a while. Right. Yeah. So um, throughout ancient and medieval times and in the Catholic and Orthodox faiths, Displaying and maintaining the bones of the deceased was a way to honor the dead. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Has anybody heard of this? I mean, well, I don't know what religion you, everybody is here. But. If you think of Catholic churches that have relics. Yes. Right? There's one in India that's got a relic that's got the, you know, the finger bone of St. Peter or something. So if they have pieces of bones of. Yeah. That's true. That's true. I mean, every Catholic altar has a little relic in it. I mean, nobody Somebody. sees it, but yeah. So exhumate, and this, this part was for Mary, who's not here, but exhumation is most common in the Eastern Orthodox Church, where bodies are exhumed several years after burial, so the bones can be transferred to an ossuary. I just didn't know that there were like religious really kind of things but I guess I shouldn't be surprised because well, there is around burial right right around burial there so I wonder how much of it is driven by um soil conditions too well think of it you know, also in the in really cold climates whenever you can't dig at uh, certain times of the year or places where there really is the topsoil and it's you're digging through rock yeah so you're in the Nether Netherlands where the soil is you know, wet how far down. Yeah. So I think that has a lot to do with your soil conditions and the weather. 
who's going to want to go out and dig up, dig up, a, you know, a 20 below or something in some areas? Spring times four. You'd be like, okay, we're done. We got uh, well, yeah, time. and then you've got that frost heave. Yeah, and then I think about like the bayou, you know, people around the bayou where they bring up coffins. I'm like, oh God, that just seems hurt. All I can think of is the beginning of Poltergeist. Do you remember that movie? <laughs> Where all the bodies are popping up, oh, yeah. the oh, crack remember. in the bottom of the swimming pool. <laughs> mm. Okay. Okay. So throughout Europe, there's caves, catacombs, and underground tunnels. Also, make for ideal ossuaries. Um, some ossuaries are kind of mass grave, holding bones of thousands of individuals who died as a result of anything from plagues to wars. Um, but they're not necessarily kept together, right? Their bones are just stacked. And like a body's worth of bones. Right? Sometimes they're stacked by types, like yeah. leg bones. But they weren't like kept with bones. bones are over here, yeah. You wouldn't be able to identify who is who. Well, uh, I guess it depends we'll on who We'll see. So, OK, oh, so oh, this yeah. is the catacombs of Paris. Right. So beneath the streets of Cer parts of Paris. Let me see, maybe I can click on this. So layers of leg bones, layers of skulls, layers of, yeah. Leave it to uh, the French to figure out how to make money out of this. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, they got fancy lights and everything. You can get your Instagram picture taken against the bones, I'm sure. Seriously, hundreds of thousands of people every year go. It's 22 <laughs> euros to tour. And that's like the cheap for price, okay? Like if you're a senior citizen. You know what 22 years <laughs> is? I looked it up, that's like $26 yeah. Yeah. US dollars. How much for a school school group? Yeah. <laughs> I know. So um, there's, so underneath certain parts of Paris, there's a lot of underground tunnels because they were dug during the Roman era. And because much of the stone used to build Paris, expand Paris came from, you know, they just dug it nearby, okay. but then Paris expanded. So once beyond the city limits, as Paris expanded, these underground tunnels began to present structural issues, no mm -hmm. wonder, for the buildings being constructed above. So toward the end of the 18th century, the tunnels, which had long since been forgotten about, began to be mapped and reinforced. Um, then there, then there were concerns during certain periods of um, pandemics um, about um, the health issues. So these tunnels presented an obvious solution. So bones were transferred from the cemeteries to the tunnels. At first, parts of the tunnels were used as a repository for bones. Um, by 1810, they were transformed into a mausoleum where the bones were neatly arranged for visitors. And by the end of the 19th century, the ossuary was open to the public on a regular basis and the quote catacombs became a popular Parisian attraction. Some estimate that the remains of, how many, how many people do you think have been interred in these catacombs? 100,000? Six million. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a lot of tunnels. Yeah, okay, so let's see. And you really think that's gravel underfoot? <laughs> <laughs> what are they walking on down there? Yeah. So um, in the yeah. Czech Republic had has quite a few. And another site I was looking at was talking about Czechia. And so I had to look it up. Where is, what is this Czechia? And this is a side note, sorry, but um, so Czech Republic is also called Czechia. Um, it comprises um, the historical provinces of Bohemia and Moravia, along with the southern tip of Silesia, collectively called the Czech lands. In 2016, the country adopted the name Czechia as a shortened informal name for the Czech Republic. Hmm. Did you that. all know that? I, I didn't know that. Okay, good. good. I mean, I'm glad <laughs> I wasn't the only one. Okay, so I'm like, wow, this yeah. is Milan, Italy. Do you, oh. Can you see it or do I need to make it bigger? Oh, I can see that plenty. Yeah. Oh my okay. goodness, but the little skulls, are those kids' skulls or are those? 
life adult schools and the pictures small. I know, but these are from a hospital cemetery, ran out of space for new burials and yeah. The church was modified in 1769 and the walls were decorated with skulls and long bones. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we are in Evera. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Did, is that what it looked like when you went? Yeah, yeah. I was just there. That was my last trip before the close down. Okay, so did you know about it? How did, did your travel agent recommend this? Like, well, no, we just, we didn't have an agent. We just went to Portugal and started playing it day by day. And it was, it was in one of the Rick Steves books or something talked about it. Okay, because this is a UNESCO World Heritage site. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's not huge. It's not, a, I mean, Ever is not a huge town really. But it was, it's kind of interesting. So were there any, this is so perfect that you were there. Did they have any names or? Oh, no, 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 no. The whole story was it was monks that exhumed, you know, 400 years of monks okay. or whatever. But those, the little ribs going down the sides of those columns. Yeah. Okay. Those, because mostly like those columns would be covered with say vertebrae. Uh, and the, the little ribs would be like the sacrum. So you've got all these, these uh, like tailbones and you don't really know what you're looking at. You're going, oh my God, and that's the little holes that the nerves come out. Wow, look at that. And then there'd be stacks of skulls and you know, they were, it was like, it was almost like ornamental mosaic on the different types of bones that they used. Like these are all, those are all like leg bones or arm bones that are going horizontal. And then for texture, the sacrum's going this way and then a little flower out of, vertebrae. I mean, it's just crazy. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. Why? Do, do we have an answer to this? Why? Why? Just as a I, way of honoring the Yeah. The dead, honoring you know? them? I know. It doesn't seem like an honor. That's, I totally Monks have a lot of time on their hands. Um, okay. So, and this is in Austria. Oh. And um, so I, yeah, well, I did this for Mary too. So yes, oh, did I, I click? This is because I can get it. Um, so they have their names and um, and their dates, and they're arranged by kin. So, I mean, like you can see in front, one's nineteen thirty six. Yeah, I think that Evans is nineteen oh six, or is that thirty? Nineteen oh four, nineteen thirty five. Yeah. Wow, and they got they got rosaries or flowers. Painted. Oh yeah, and it was a thing to like in lieu of flowers that you decorated the skull. I I don't know what to say. Yeah, <laughs> I they don't needed, know. They needed to get an internet or something because man, they got way too much time. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, but they also have the problem that they can't stay in the ground forever because they have limited space. Yes, okay. see, it's a very specific tradition that started in 1720 when it became It's the obvious. clean part that gets to me. Oh, yeah, they're yeah, removed. They clean. Just put it out there and letting the bugs take care of it, you know. Ooh. Yeah. Did you have to pay to go to the one in Portugal? Yeah, it wasn't much, but and it, you know, the, we, there was no catacomb. It was just all, oh, it was this just... Is Ridiculous. There's a vertebrae up there. Spine. You want me to make it bigger? Are you okay, Cindy? You're not freaking no, out. No, I'm fine. I'm I, just uh, this is trying to see. That's well, that's actually actually something. Uh yeah, I don't know, but hmm. okay. now who's weird? We were talking about weird Wednesday. Uh -huh, that's what Maybe. I was just and now I'm thinking she that ain't so weird. Yeah. She's right in line with some of these. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, open every day except for Christmas Eve. <laughs> oh darn it! It's the only time I want to go is Christmas Eve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now here's oh Germany. check this out. What the heck? Human bones have been used to mark out Latin words. Yeah. Wow. I so yeah. Seems like you recognize it. Um. Okay, so then we've got England. So in <laughs> London, in that one. Oh man! So in London, uh, the Church of Saint Bride, agreed. I don't know how they say it. Was destroyed by bombs during World War II. So during excavations in 1953, 
required for the rebuilding of the church. Archaeology discoveries reveal the history that goes back 2,000 years. Besides the Roman remains dating back to the first century, crypts were found to contain you know, thousands of humans. Um, and they are thought to be the bones of those who died in the Great Plague of 1665 and the cholera epidemic of 1854. And after the 1854 epidemic, no more burials were allowed in the city of London. So the crypts were sealed and forgotten about. Um, so we think we have a problem with single use plastic, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, we, we, I, sometimes I feel like the US is so far behind well, because we are, we've got so much space. Yeah, but so it's going to... Yeah, I know. We ought, to, we ought to take this as a, you know... Oh, well, I know. They should have some, some town in the Midwest somewhere should say, well, we'll be the capital, bring us your bones. And there stuff. are some places where you can get green burials now, where your body is put in a biodegradable sack, and you're buried down with a tree buried over you so that you totally become dirt as and feed the tree but those are you know there's so many laws around burial that it has to be special places that will allow that yeah you think about it there's probably some city somewhere that could be making a fortune off of something like that yeah it up for that yeah there's San Francisco that's for sure oh you know what I'm gonna go back to one of those Skulls. One of these, because oh, here it was in, and this is a different town oh, in old. France, but as far as the genealogy, they do have information on the walls. Um, huh. So it really does depend, but I'm just kind of like, wow, clearly all my ancestors in Italy and Switzerland, I, and, and I, re, I was there, the last time I was there, it was like, okay, I want to go to this cemetery. But I, there was enough of a, a language issue that right. I just, I could not understand. They're like, no, this is new. And I'm like, the cemetery has clearly been here for centuries. Yeah, and they're like, yeah. yeah, but they're all new, you know? So now I get what they meant by new, because I just like, Okay, I give, you know. Okay, what did you mean? I don't know. What did they mean by new? The only recent. young people are buried. Recent, yeah, recent yeah. burials, you know. But they didn't say what happened. I, I, and I will now uh, text, you know, or email my cousins and over there and say, okay, I, I kind of get it. But like, where are their bones? I mean, because maybe there was an ossuary or... And you know, actually, now that I'm saying this out loud, I think there was like this building, you know, and I just, and they're like, they're there. And I'm like, what does uh, that yeah. mean? Yeah. But, oh, okay. so it was could about, you imagine, could you, you imagine a coal and stuff on the outside of the building when you were there? <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine a place like India, though, if they didn't do oh. cremation? And with as populated that country is, they would run out of space in a heartbeat. China. Yeah. Yeah. So Serbia, where are you Gerbics from? Slovenia. <laughs> Slovenia. Okay. Yeah, well, look at that one smiling. That looks like a jack-o'-lantern right there on the left-hand side of that yeah. door. Oh my gosh. There's below it. Oh man. Okay. So this is, you know, like Caspian how people where they get buried and okay in Verdun the, the picture in France I just showed you there are Germans buried there because it was a war uh, a battle of Verdun and I'm probably slashing that name but anyway so there are French and Germans there so it's like you know when we're doing genealogy if we are looking for a bury, burial information and they died in a war, the body still may not be, have been returned or, yeah, you know. Might be in somebody's wall. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, Thank you like for that nice segue. <laughs> yes, so piling up heaps of skull, skulls of your vanquished foes represented the peak of barbaric <laughs> warlord behavior. 
like I, I am afraid of like Serbs. I mean, I feel like, is that like really, um, how do you say like, you know, you can't lump everybody together, but I don't know. <laughs> this is kind of a brutal story. So the, um, let's see. So in 1809, it was a turning point in the course of the first Serbian uprising against the Ottoman Empire. And the outnumbered rebel army faced 36,000 strong force of Turkish Imperial Guards by the strategically important city of NIS, however you say that, this is where this is at. And rather than surrender or flee, they decided to put up a desperate last stand. So faced with imminent annihilation, the rebel commander, Steven Sindelik, in an act of desperation, fired a shot into a gunpowder keg at the fully stocked gun powder room, blowing up his entire army, as well as wiping out enemy soldiers that were already flooding the rebel trenches. So the Turkish commander was really mad and angered by what happened. And he decided to teach a grim lesson to the Serbian nation. The bodies of the dead rebels were, oh, well, I guess I shouldn't necessarily get so gross, but anyway, uh, <laughs> They sent the decapitated heads to the imperial court in Istanbul as proof of Turkish victory. The skulls were used as building blocks for a tower built at the main road of the entrance of the city as a warning to the local populace of an impending fate to any potential future rebels. That would have worked for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, Latvian the impaler, right? The heads the spikes. So there are 952 skulls and um, the tower, you know, so they made this tower, 56 rows with 17 skulls in each row on each side of the tower. Um, and then this, the commander that fired the shot was placed on the top. And so this gruesome edifice left a deep scar in the Serbian national psyche. However, it failed at its purpose. The Serbs rebelled again and successfully driving off the Turks and won independence in 1830. In the years following, the families of the deceased rebels chiseled away oh. some of the skulls to give them a proper burial. Well, how did they know who was who? Just the skulls in general, I think. Oh, okay, so just burying mm -hmm. No, so today out of 952, 58 still remain in the tower. And so the authorities of Serbia built a chapel around it um, to preserve oh. this unique monument of bravery and suffering. And here is... How did they make him smile? Just prop open the jaw. Oh. Well, it looked like they had teeth or something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was kind of gross. Okay, so that was, that was the end. I don't know if you have questions. If you have questions, uh -huh. I don't know if I'll know the answer. But, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought you had more more uh, questions and comments. She, she has I other topics. Yeah, I have other topics. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so so the next one is the importance of names and naming patterns, and I know that this is one you guys may know, but maybe I will touch on things that I don't know you needed to hear again, or I'm writing it down. Okay, so why are names important and what can you learn from a first name? Um, so obviously we usually concentrate on surnames since, um, you know, it's usually inherited. And obviously sometimes it is changed, but not that often. And given names are way more important because they represent a voluntary choice by the parents and usually a name is not given lightly. We all angsted over what we'd name our children, I imagine. It re represents thought and feelings and can be significant. Um, so of course, right at the beginning, we, there are naming patterns. Um, you'll often see this because we all have this and it drives us crazy. The same names used over and over again. 
Um, while certain names are popular in different areas and in different times of history, the repetition can be a pattern. And because many cultures believe in honoring their elders, they name their children after them. So I know we have a lot of people with English and Irish um, ancestors. And so I'll just briefly go over that. Um, so the first son is named after the father's father. What, what, what culture is this? Uh, England and Ireland. And the first daughter is named after the mother's mother. Okay, so the first, first son is? Father's father. Okay. Uh, first daughter, mother's mother. So the ma maternal grandmother. The second son is named after the mother's father. And the second daughter is named after the father's mother. The third son is named after the father. And the third daughter is named after the mother. The fourth son is named after the father's eldest brother. And the fourth daughter is named after the mother's eldest sister. Uh, the brother and sister. Where did you find this? Because that sounds like something that that's family. probably have like a, uh, like a something there. So we could probably help figure out some of our old family members. Oh yeah, family tree. Um, it's family hyphen tree dot co dot uk. Family, say it one more time. Uh, family hyphen tree dot co dot uk. So and now um, and there's a the, thing here about naming patterns. Uh, the, and uh, let me see what it's they call that. Yeah, uh, naming patterns, I guess. But now this rest of the, my information is from genealogy.com. And um, so, but obviously, you know, human nature, Some people you know, that. you can't always follow it exactly. You know, no new mother of her firstborn son would name him after a drunken, abusive father-in-law rather than her beloved father that had recently died. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you'd have to- Maybe you don't have brothers or sisters or, yeah. Right. So, um, but I thought, well, that is a good point if you knew that, but you probably wouldn't. But if you did, but that is something to look at if the firstborn son wasn't married after the father's father, maybe there is a reason. If it was the mother's father, maybe there was a recent death or. And it's funny because my, my first go-to is that the, if you've got a, a son or a daughter that's named after the mother or the father, it must be the oldest. True. Yeah, but here it's like third down before you get to that. That's true because yeah. we do yeah. the senior, junior. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Except for that the father could have been named after his father. Yeah. yeah. So then he names. So so when it's named, how am I trying to say this? So the, the son, firstborn son, is named after the father's father, which also happens to be the father's right. name. Oh. Yeah. I'm not finding anything about family patterns, family naming patterns on this family tree uh, site, the UK one. Just ask them. Hey, Bill. Let me look back here. Hold on. Um, I'll, I'll try looking. Okay. It says, hmm. it, but then, each culture does it differently, right? Yes. Well, some but they said it, it, it followed with Ireland. Ireland followed it, though. Um, um okay so much of early united states was was you know english and irish so right that was why i yeah and uh, there would be german yeah. patterns too i don't know what those are if they're similar or not right um so and then of course you know 
we see names of parents and grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles repeated, but not in any strict order. So, you know, it is still difficult. You can't really go totally by that. Um, and half the names of the family might appear to be repeats. There, there always seems to be a few totally different ones. Um, 11 comes to mind, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> But then, then there was more than one 11 though, right? His grandson was 11. Oh, okay, yeah. So a child might be named after a good friend or a popular hero of the times. A lot of presidents in my family. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So even if the family didn't um, follow the strict pattern, um, the repetition can be significant. Um, so say you're researching a family group that went West and the family had children named Benjamin, Obadiah, and Catherine. So when these children married, they tended to carry on those same names. You know they came from New England, but have no proof as to where. But if you find a family with a surname in Rhode Island with children named George, John, William, and Anne, and another family in Vermont with Benjamin, Obadiah, and Catherine, you know, you're gonna put your yeah. first effort there. Um, so I just shared a link of this one slide I found that has a bunch of information too. Oh, okay. In the chat. So then, um, some names, um, people name them as a virtue. So some of the most fascinating names from early New England were parents sometimes named their children after virtues they hoped they would possess patience, charity, prudence, thankful. Does anybody have relatives with those names? I have an I have a cousin family member. I think his name is Wrestling. Wrestling. <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> wrestling. Oh, wrestling! I thought you meant like wrestling cattle. I'm like, I don't think that's a virtue. Oh, wrestling! Oh, wrestling! <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend that suggested that we name Michaela Chief Justice. Oh. Not that, that kind of would set the course in life. <laughs> but yeah, no. I mean, I have a friend that has mother named him Melchizedek and he did become a pastor and and my mother-in-law's name was Prudence she went by her middle name Adele but um so yeah um yeah so and then in New England because I know um at least Tamberley has a lot of family there Benoni which to me sounds like it's Italian but B E N -O -N -I. Oh, yeah, my uh, probably oh. eighth or ninth great grandfather was Benoni Tucker. Oh, my that, gosh. Do you uh, know what that means? Absolutely no idea. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Georgie, go for it. In early New England, it is believed that the name Benoni was associated with sorrow and was used when the mother was not married or died in childbirth or if the circumstances were in some way unfortunate. Oh, interesting. Benoni, how do you spell that again? B-E-N-O-N-I. Yeah. I'll have to look up my family tree and see if I have any of those. That's yeah. interesting. You'll have to look back, Tamberly, yeah. and see if there was I something have a tragic. Benoni Tucker. Oh. That's probably from the like 1600s, late 1600s. Uh, mm. huh. They didn't say, I wonder what, or I didn't write it. I down. wonder what the derivation of that. I mean, I wonder what what root word that goes uh, back to. Google Translate. So <laughs> you said even when the mother was unmarried. But not when the mother was unmarried and died, but like. No, it could, it, it was associated with sorrow and was sorrow. used when the mother was not married or died in childbirth or if the circumstances were in some way unfortunate. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a Latin word that would be been. Ben. Nothing comes to not know what that word. Benoni. Sounds Latin. Yeah, I thought it sounded Italian, but. Oh, well, look, I have this huge computer sitting next to me. I can just look. <laughs> Google Translate or something, yeah. Interesting. So, yes, well, would, it'd be cool if you could report if there was some. Oh, there's a chess opening called. Yeah, I will, I oh. will look now. About <laughs> defense. Because that's a line that goes, that goes way the heck. 
Oh, really back. I don't know. To see. Might not know. Oh, it just wants to talk about chess. Oh, here it is as a name. If his mom died. Hebrew. Yeah, Noni was. Oh, wait. It's a boy's name of Hebrew origin, and the meaning is son of my sorrow. Oh. It has to do with Rachel, mother of ben Benjamin, knew she was dying after his birth and called her. Oh, life. my gosh. But Jacob, his father, changed the name to Benjamin, and they're spelling it Benjamin, B-E-N-Y-A-M-I-N. Mm. Oh, that's oh, interesting. That's yeah, my, my Benoni was 1664. Did it, can you tell if his mom died and how? I will. Is he the last child to that mother? There, I can go back one generation further than that. Oh. My gosh, that is amazing what you have. <laughs> Look at that. See what you did there, Chris? <laughs> it's on a baby name site is where I'm looking now. Oh, interesting. Boy, I'm learning a lot of good stuff. Um, How in the heck do you live to be 71 years old when, oh no, he was born in, in 1662. How do you live to be 71 years old when you're born in 1662? Wow. Because it wasn't that uncommon if once you got to be born and got out of childhood. Yeah, I guess then you're because he would have probably lived to 110 if he had been born in 1900. <laughs> yeah, good lord. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. No I will more. have to look and see. I was on a female. <laughs> so um, now recycled names. I'm like, really? We just are talking about recycled plots, but I've never <laughs> heard this terminology, recycled names. So. Up until this century, parents could usually count on one third of their children not surviving. If a child died, the name was often used again. Right. So if a baby died and the next child of the same sex would often be given the same name. So when checking birth records, you should never stop when you find the name you're looking for. You should continue for a few more years because the first child could have died and your ancestor could have been the second child in the family of that name. So if an older child died- George Foreman all over again. <laughs> what did George you say? Foreman. George Foreman all over again. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. So if you see George in the 1850 census as a six-year-old and then in the 1860 census as an eight-year-old, it may uh -huh. mean that the first one died shortly after the 1850 census was Wow. Started. So to me, that was worth almost the whole. Yeah, research. yeah. Because, you know, sometimes we're like, no, this can't be because. Yeah, you just move on to another family. Yeah. Yeah. But interesting. So, so I just recently realized this, that my father was named for his brother who died as an infant. Oh, oh my really? gosh. Remember I was telling you guys that I found, I uncovered a, a, a death certificate for an Anthony Gerbic who was months old and he died right. from burns because it said yeah. on the desk yeah. he's too close yeah. to the stove yeah burns from the stove and that child died and so the next birth was a boy and that was my dad's name wow Same. wow i guess it was so again going to those naming patterns there must have been some serious we have to follow these rules kind of thing because why why would you know we yeah. have to have another anthony i mean there was lots of anthony's in my family but you couldn't have come up with samuel or something else but I mean, a real but feeling of the need for that conformity with it whatever must have, yeah they must have said we must have a child to survive with this name did your dad know that did well, he I talk about ask. that <laughs> he's dead no i don't think my dad knew oh he you know what he did he told me that there was a child he was named for that oh. had died but he got the story wrong he thought it was an old or much older child but not the one right before him. A year he before. No, he was a replacement. I don't think he knew. He did everything he had was stories people had told him. Mm. And so, yeah, I, he, I think he did. I think he did know something. Now that I think about it. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it, but you're right. He was named after the baby who died. And it's, it's weird because that baby lived a bunch of months and then she gets pregnant again right after. And it seems like it'd be too soon yeah mm -hmm. naming the baby again yeah. the irish that's, twins i mean that's weird to use in kind of a reverse way too that when you see a a really big age split 
you know, or not age split, but a gap. Gap, yeah. Three or four years, you mean? In pregnancy is to go back and see whether or not there's any other names that match the name of the next couple of the next boy and the next girl. Yeah. In oh, you mean because the missing child would have been that one? Yeah, that maybe that maybe in that gap there's a name that there you you could you can assume maybe that there was a lost pregnancy or a death of a child, but then even go further to see if if you can find that child based on the names that the the next children were given. Yeah, interesting. Well, in our family, or an earlier census them. to find more siblings. Yeah, remember the ones in Ohio that I looked at? They didn't even have a place on the birth certificate for so birth, then uh, for name. It just, it just had father's name, mother's name, how old they were and date the baby's born male or female. There was no place for the child's first name. Yeah, I've had some. 1900s, yeah. 1920s, 1900, 1920s. That's what I've ran across a whole bunch of times. It just says male, female and the parents' names and how old the parents were and their address. Hmm. And these weren't even like Native Americans that didn't count at that time or after. Nope. Mm -hmm. It was my uh, close family grandfather's wow. kids. That's weird. It's like they yeah, didn't not even, even not even, they just assume you you won't be naming this child for a while. So, <laughs> so my grandmother was a baby, you know, in the eighteen eighties in Illinois. She was baby, baby, baby. no, or French Canadian. Would you uh, call her baby what? Renault, R-E-N-A-U. Oh, the last, Is that the last name? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, there are some people that are like, you know, oh, I'm going to name, if it's a girl, I'm going to name her Nancy. And then they're like, whoa, she doesn't look like a Nancy. We have to rethink this, but. Yeah. Well, in our family, the same thing is happening. You know, it's constant naming the kids after these people. But once you get into like the ninth and 10th kid, they get a little more creative. But, but the, I've noticed when I'm doing my family history in Arkansas, they're naming them and then they're calling them completely different names. So yeah. it's like, okay, we're going to name you Mary after so-and-so, but your name is going to be Poppy, you know, or whatever. It was, it was a constant, uh, I was getting confused. Like, well, is this Mary or is this Poppy? Who am I talking about now? You know, and it would be because they called them always something else. Yep. We're gonna okay, what you got? Let's get to that. Let's see where. Hmm. So that, that was interesting. Was, uh, let's see. That Benoni yeah. is really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, nicknames. You may think you have a relationship all figured out, only to come upon a completely different name. I said we did that perfect, didn't I? You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nicknames were common in earlier times. I didn't realize that, but um, especially for girls. Um, of course, it's not enough their surname changes, but now they have nicknames. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, the woman that wrote the article said she thought she'd never figure out all the wives one man had. He was married to Anne, Margaret, Agnes, Hannah, and Nancy in different records. But she found out that Anne, Hannah, Nan, and Nancy were all variations of the same name. Right. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I had no idea. And Nancy, Hannah, Anna, Hannah, Ann, Nan, and Nancy. But but Elizabeth and Beth and Bessie yeah. and you know Lizzie. All right. Those are all, Eliza. Those are all. Yeah. So then then the other example, of course, that they gave was Margaret, which you know is my the one I'm trying to find, Margarita. Maggie, Rita, Madge, Greta, Peggy. Peggy. Yeah. And Peggy, that's weird. Daisy, because that's what Marguerite. Yeah. Was ran, so. Oh, is that yeah. right? And then, yeah. Oh. And then oh, Mary, God. we all have Marys, right? Yes. So, um, I didn't know nicknames for Mary. Polly. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Polly. And Polly. Polly is a nickname for Mary. Yeah, that's what it's. They say. Yeah, I thought it was for Margaret. No, I think it's Mary. And then Molly's, isn't that a nickname for Mary also? Or not? They only. I know. I thought Mary. There's a million, right? But they only mentioned three: Polly, Minnie, and Paulette. Minnie, uh, Paulette. I never even heard of Paulette, like Polly, but 
Paulette. Oh, I, I had a college friend who was a Paulette. Like a baby chicken. I know a couple. <laughs> like a Paulette. <laughs> My aunt's named Minnie. Minnie Jean, and I have a Peggy Sue. Or a Peggy Jean. No, Peggy. So, know. Peggy. Is Peggy's real name Margaret? No, it's Peggy. Oh. And is Minnie's name really Minnie? Mm -hmm. Or is it Minerva or Mary? But again, they're like at the end of the of the list of like 12 or something. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is the South too, which yeah. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, most male nicknames are more straightforward. Neil for Cornelius. Now I haven't mm -hmm. even thought of that one, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you I I wish I don't have any Cornelius in my family. That does. Oh, okay. Or did any of them get called Neil? Yeah. Oh, okay. it took a while to realize that. It, it, well, and interesting, he, he was baptized a Neil, um, but one of his grandsons is Thomas Cornelius. Oh, okay. So, which is, I think is really an interesting thing. Okay, so yes. So what frequently happens with men is they decide to go by their middle name. Everyone will know them by their middle name and they'll get written up in county histories under that nickname. So John William might be called Bill most of the time. So when it, but then on official documents, they'll, he'll try it out as full legal name, but you know, you're looking over for Bill or William and completely overlook John. And so my husband, there's five siblings, four, his four siblings all use their middle name and it's it's an issue i mean yeah i know yeah. does do you know why because yes my mother-in-law she's like well we have the names picked out but john patrick he just didn't look like a john he looked like a patrick then then she goes down the line you know mary kathleen she didn't look like a mary so we call her kathy you know, it's like <laughs> Oh, the picture I showed you earlier of the, the guy in the military uniform, yeah. his yeah. real name is Francis John Gerbic, but they all call him Jack. Because his first name is Francis. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Jack is the name for John, right? Yeah, yeah. Jack. And I never understood that about JFK. People would be talking about JFK oh. and then they'd be talking about Jack Kennedy. I'm like, what yeah, no, are you yes. talking yeah. about? And yeah, my dad's a John that the only time you ever see John is when he signs his name, but it's always Jack. So all the photos so always Jack. have Jack or Jackie Jack. written on them, but not, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Because we don't do that, right? Our names, all four of us are using the names that we were given, right? As our first names, right? And the, yeah, well, but I'm a Cynthia. Well, uh, but you're still yeah. using Cynthia. Cindy. Cynthia. Yeah, I do use Cynthia often, but I'm saying, but I was going to say Pat. Is a George Patrick Stanford. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And yeah, <laughs> and he signs his name G. Patrick Stanford. Yeah. So it's my job to make sure that he's, you know, understood that George, because because his grandfather and father were both Georges, so they had to come up with, you know, different ways to oh, distinguish him. Right. And so Pat was Pat. Yeah. I wonder if we started, you know, as we got farther and farther our ancestors from coming from whatever old country, if we just got more independent about our children's names. If we got more what? As we got farther and farther generations away from whatever right. our family culture, the culture we were right from, I wonder if we just got more like, hell no, like I named my kid Caspian. You know, yeah. there's no Caspian. There's no Caspian after the war. They have nothing thing. to do with family, except the Darling's middle name is Anthony. But my father had just died. So Sterling what? Anthony. Be, but my, because my oh, father the had middle just name. died. Yeah. But you oh, named your kids after the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Well, Cas no, was, Narnia. Yeah, yeah, Caspian was, but not Sterling. No. There's not a Sterling in... Oh yeah, I mean, look at the names that people are naming their children. You know, apple, clover. Yeah. Um, hmm. So okay, but thank you, Susan, for the segue into baptismal names. Ooh. So um, in Catholic churches, especially, but also in others, the Latin name will be used at the time of baptism. I think this. I don't know that that's done now, but we're talking about ancestors that back then, and most. Um, 
let's see. Um, let's see. So if you see a person Christen, Chris, christened Bonifacius, but you know, if you looked up that, um, you know, you might not realize that all his life he went by Bonaparte, you know, instead of the Latin for Bonifacius. Um, so, yeah, I think that it is important that we, because I think we do all use those church records at some point. My Mary, with my husband's family all and all of the cousins, nobody had a, had a given middle name. They all had a given first name and a and a second name because the middle name then would be your confirmation name that you would take. So my sister-in-law, who all her records are Mary Petrovich until she was conformed and then confirmed, and then she's Mary McCole Petrovich. What was her middle name? Mick Michael, essentially. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. But so my husband never had a middle name because he wouldn't get confirmed. So he just was Joseph with no middle name Petrovich. It's wow. in, in the, you know, the Mexican culture, they take the mother's maiden name as their middle name. That's very common. But well, it's, it's used as, it's not part of the middle name, though. It's just used as part of the last name. Yeah. It's a yeah. so-and-so, so, 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 so you mark to both the parents. And it can get confusing whenever you're trying to decide what's your last name, because it's not hyphenated. Yeah. So it could be, you know, Lopez G Gonzalez. But Lopez is your mother's maiden name, but you sometimes, ugh, it's just confusing. Or it can be Gonzalez Gonzalez because both your parents happen to have the same last, yeah. So well, my girls have my middle maiden, names. My, my girls' middle names are my maiden name. Harrison. My yes. kids are too. Yes. They have yes. my middle name too. Yes. But they have a middle, middle name and then they have a, a, a sec, Caspian Lear Gerbic Forsyth and Sterling is Sterling Anthony Gerbic oh. Forsyth. But the Stanford's have that too. Or yeah, my kids Sterling, only still, Sterling uses Gerbic Forsyth hyphenated on a lot of things, yeah. but not everything. But Caspian's just straight up Forsyth. Yeah, and my kids that that is their middle name. They don't have a middle name other than Harrison. Really? Yeah. Wow. You I don't mean, use, I don't use Sue. When I got married, I used Harrison as my middle name. And so both of my girls have Harrison as their middle name. So you're Kimberly <laughs> Sue Harrison. That's what I was born, yeah. And now I'm Tamberla Harrison Petrovich and Michaela Harrison Petrovich and Samantha Harrison Petrovich. So well, it's not a hyphenated good. last name, it's just their middle name. Mm. But I'm fine. glad you mentioned that about the confirmation because my grandmother doesn't have a middle name. And it, it was like, how could you not have a middle name? You know, why she wasn't confirmed? Right. I don't know. Now I can't ask. All of them, they take the they take their religious name as the, yeah. Huh. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, um, all right. Well, then, of course, now we we do have like some German names, in, you know, in our backgrounds. So, of course, that's you probably already all know that. Like, there's a lot of Johans. So. Um, you might find a family with Johan, George, Johan, Jacob, Johan, Michael. Friedrich, yeah. Yeah. So oh, the first name is all the same. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes. So, but um, my Hans, Michael, or Hans, Jacob. Yes, they're all the same. And so I didn't even realize, but in the Alsace area of France, the administration the area went back and forth between France and Germany. So some records can be in German and some in French. So wow. it could be Johann Jacob or Hans Jacob, depending, or, you know, or Jean Jacques, you know, just- Depending on who, who was in charge of Alsace at the time. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Oh my gosh. So that's where the <laughs> Caspian thing, that was what I thought when you sent the link, I'm like, okay, that might, yeah. Be interesting you know you know somebody might need some kind of information um and then i don't know that this uh happens to any of us well maybe this sounds like and you know usually that's an asian name that can't be translated right. easily 
So Japanese Tamio became Tommy. Yeah, something that was pronounceable. So anyway, yeah. So that was what I had. And I'm so sorry this took longer, way longer than I thought because you guys had like awesome <laughs> feedback and comments. Oh, you know us, we're so shy. We never ask questions. <laughs> I know, we are shy girls. Well, that was really interesting. I got lots out of that. Yeah. Oh. Good. So, I'm glad. I'm sorry it wasn't very visually. Um, that's <laughs> right. I left it on the four screen of us because. So, um, so I know that you have some more. So I know, but it's three. I know. So yeah. we can do a dare Dream part two down the line. <laughs> okay. For, for the other, I can't remember what the topics were. There's yeah. Audrey two, and then we've got Dare two. Yeah. <laughs> I love little shop of horrors. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so you could continue with your other ones on another day. Yeah. Because this was great. Good idea. Okay. So since I'm recording, why don't you guys pop in some of the things you want to ask Caspian and I'll just share this video and tell them at the very end is your little things you want to know. Okay. I'll go for, well, no, I have to look up a date. First. Okay. I'll go first. So I want to know about the 1948 rebellion that went up across Europe and don't even know the circumstances exactly, except for that some of my people in Swishling Holstein, Holstein especially, were kind of involved in that. And I think it was a German thing. And um, so I wanna know about that. And then I, know that I have some Eastern European and several of you all do. So about the Austria-Hungary borders, um, how the countries became independent or not independent, what wars fought over it, um, just kind of a general background about what all that's about. You know, Poland, I've got an ancestor who, depending on the census, is from Austria, from Hungary, from Prussia, um, or from Venice, <laughs> you know. So what's that all about? I do too. Austria, Hungary, uh, the my Slovenian thing, depending on which which thing we're looking at, they're coming from different countries. Yeah, it's I think we're easy. probably talking about, you know, the 1800s, because that would be mostly with our ancestors that we're dealing with. But, you know, it started before that, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then I'd like to know more about the colonial wars. And this may be something that Tamberly and Susan, I don't know how far back your mother's line goes. Uh, into uh, Scotland in the 1600s is where I think, I think, so, but when did they come to the when did they come to the United States? 1600s. Okay, so I know that there was colonial wars, at least four known ones. One was the King Philip's War. I don't remember the others that our ancestors would have been soldiers in fighting, you know, before the Revolutionary War, because they would have been on the British side. And of course, there was the French and Indian War too, which um, is you know, Canada and all that. So some of that might give us some historical background for what people were doing or not doing. So those are the ones I came up with so far. I'm sure you can answer them. I don't know, that's great. This is just an aside, but in, in getting ready for my question, I'm flipping through this family genealogy and the children of Morris Tucker, the oldest child, and this is 1662 was Benoni. Oh, the oldest. By the first wife. Then the second child she is by the second wife. Oh, oh the first yes. wife. Dear, do you just solve the mystery? Oh. You know, well, that then makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, but it really makes me sad to hear that. <laughs> oh. It makes sense. So my question is. So it was a boy. But Oni's always a boy? That, boy that's what yeah. it's said so is there an equivalent in, in a for a female name uh they didn't say but it seems like Benona. no <laughs> i don't know, <laughs> I don't know. But, that's a that's an interesting question so huh hmm. 
So did the child die right after the mother? Do you think? I mean, the, no, the, the, the mother died right before the mother died after the child, like during pregnancy. Well, to get a name that's attached to sorrow, I bet that the mother probably died in childbirth or before the yeah. name was named. And father or, probably mar married rather quickly because he had an infant. He had to year, year and a half later. He's got year and a half later. He's got his second child by his or his, by his second wife. Yeah. Yeah. So they must have married pretty quick. Yeah. He didn't happen to marry a sibling. I mean, the the sister, no. sister-in-law. No. Uh -uh. But that would be a possibility. That yeah. So my, my dad, my grandfather did that. He married, oh, she okay. came in to live in the household somewhere, somewhere before his wife had died. And then she died. And then next thing you know, she's pregnant and she had the baby. Another one of those six month pregnancies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boy, they had a lot of them back in those days. Yeah. All babies take nine months, but sometimes the first one comes sooner. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kimberly, what was your question? Uh, uh, My question is: Caspian the Tuckers in 1640 were in Bermuda, and they're English, and then they immigrated from Bermuda to Massachusetts, which seems a little harsh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm wondering what what the driving force to go from, I mean, Bermuda, I guess, being colonized for something, but what the driving force to go from Bermuda up to the Massachusetts colony would be. Well, you're like they were having such a fun time in 1650, I want to join them. <laughs> or the influence of the Virginia company, I don't know. Do you know what they worked at? What was their occupation? I don't know. I mean, I'd have to actually read through this thing that I've never. I would think rum or sugar or something like that. I would probably learn a lot by reading through this whole. Oh my goodness. <laughs> giant genealogy. But it's always seemed like, boy, that's a, you know, you're going Bermuda. What the heck? I mean, it must've been some sort of plantation, I would think. I mean, the only reason you'd be in Bermuda would be the crown is getting something off of it, right? Yeah. 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 And then to go from there to, yeah, there's nothing about what they were. One of them was the governor of, of Bermuda, but I don't know what the, what the trade was that, um, when hostilities broke out between the mother country and the colonies, St. George Tucker left the bar and conducted a secret and successful expedition to Bermuda, his native land, where he knew, he knew there were a large quantity of military supplies and fortifications slenderly garrisoned. Yeah, so I don't know what, what, were, what were the British doing in Bermuda and what would cause you to to move from Bermuda unless you were becoming heavily landed in Massachusetts, but that's a pretty rough time to be in the Massachusetts colonies. So yeah. hmm. I mean, Indians and all that. So yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I don't know. That is a very good question. It was kind of like that surprise to me that whole Key West thing. And I had mentioned oh, yeah, that yeah, during the Civil War to somebody else, and they said, "Well, yeah, of course the British were were um, thinking of siding with the Confederates because the cotton was the cotton from the South is what was feeding all the new industrial revolution in England and the cotton mills, so they didn't want the South to go down and to lose the slave trade. That's what kept the cotton cheap. Well, okay, that makes sense. I, re I remember uh, Albert." It was Albert, right? Yeah, wasn't he? In the Civil War, yeah, Albert was just, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of perplexity about what should happen. Lincoln, Lincoln's saying, hey, we need some help. And Albert's like, well, you know, I don't know. If we really taking our economy down, dude, yeah. Yeah, the South is looking pretty good there, you know? We kind of gotta, we gotta protect both sides. It you was know, part of it is, you know, kids being kids and being young, but it really shows how history is not taught right oh that's for sure <laughs> history is so taught as these fragments of things and not 
you know, global, it would be so much more interesting if we could teach it in something where you could see how things were moving around and the kids had some sort of attachment to it. I think it's too much time it takes to teach those classes. Yeah. Well, they do teach a, a world history classes and stuff, but it it's just a generic like, okay, we're moving to Egypt this week, you know? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. now we're going like the over whole to interconnectedness and why, and and then you'd kind of remember things. Yes. So. And I like it when they relate it to people somehow, so that it feels like it's part of your family somehow. Right. Well, it's kind of like that old uh, series Connections. You remember that that you said? Yes. 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 Oh yes, my that God. was so good. That was I saw so a book. Good. Yeah, yeah. Darby, what do you want to ask Caspian? Oh, um, okay. So it it became obvious that like in 1900 um, and in 1905, my grandfather, that there were many people from his little Swiss village went to France and were in Paris, you know, Clearly, they're working there. They they would go back to Switzerland, but but what was the draw? Did they have some sort of skill that was unique, or I don't think so. And no, I mean I think the, his father was worked for um, like the the railroad. I mean he probably they were like annual labor stone masons or something that was called on because they were working on a. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that there was like the village had nothing. It was just in the winter. It's just freezing cold for months and months and months and months and months. Was it known for anything, the village? No, it, it's still tiny. It, it now it's a tourist spot because they've got skiing and mountaineering and you know. But I mean that's a relatively new thing. I mean, for centuries, it was just a cold like Siberia, practically. I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. So then there's the San Guitar Tunnel, which links, um, you know, countries. Yeah. It's that, you know, commerce, but that was it. I mean, that's just it's but it's not tiny. like all the, the goldsmiths of Europe all come from this building. ceramic capital of the world. Right. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. Laborers is what they were. And they probably wanted to get the hell out of there during the winter. And what, well, what was going on in Paris that there was enough employment that you could have so many from that? You know, were they building? Yeah. Maybe that's so maybe name the place again. Were, what part of what part of Switzerland are we talking about? Uh, um, up by Italy, this uh, to China. right over the border, right over the border to Italy, and they were Italian speakers, right? They were Italian speakers. So, did they also speak French? Just because? See, it makes no sense things, to me. No, I mean, no. If you go there, they it, and even if you know how we looked on their municipal site, and it talks about what languages are spoken there. Yeah this it's not french i mean if anything it'd be a little more german but it's also oh, french isn't even like a dominant language there no no huh. it's all italian a little german i mean i'm sure some could speak french, yeah. but um, wow somebody should sum up what mary seibert would be asking caspian oh yeah could somebody give a She's like where she's from, the time frame we're talking about, and well, that's same yes. Eastern Europe. It could figure out the borders at different oh, times. Oh, she's got the, Rush, the Russian um, border with yeah, um, Western Ukraine, Poland border. Yeah, but the Ru Russian. Austria. Where? Yeah, I can't remember. The late 1800s, right? Well, then it was this stuff down by early 1900s to the Crimean Peninsula. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. But yeah. there was the whole Russian border. The town that she's identified is on the border between Russia and whatever countries, Ukraine? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Crimea is Ukraine. Yeah. 
and she had a lot of questions about the the religion what was that we were looking it up it was uh oh, it was the greek orthodox church that was over yeah, the greek orthodox religion yeah. oh yeah we couldn't understand why there was a Gr greek orthodox present way over there wasn't it yeah, evidently it was somehow linked to trade but i could see how the, yeah but it seems yeah like remember we figured out you could go trade. through to crimea from turkey to turkey oh well, god you go through like three or four different countries to i mean it's not convenient yeah. There was a very big Greek Orthodox presence in yes. Crimea and Greece. Well, it makes was, me think if it was a trading post that the Greeks were there permanently enough if they were, they weren't just going there to trade if they established a church. You know. That's a good point. Yeah, she had a lot of questions about that area. So, so Mary Seiper, who's not here right now, obviously, she, her family is from that area of the Ukraine. Are we supposed to say the Ukraine or are we supposed to just say Ukraine? I think there's a we think there's a proper way of doing that nowadays. It is you it's Ukraine. There is no the. There's no the. And her family came over uh, to Pennsylvania and they were coal miners, very poor. And this is in the early 1900s. Right? Right. You guys help me out here. Yeah. I, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. <laughs> um, and they settled in the Pennsylvania area, a lot of coal miners, and a lot of them are still in the Pennsylvania area. Mm -hmm. And she would probably be interested in anything that has to do with that world or stuff. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't know so about the drama with her, with her grandfather, though. Great grandfather. <laughs> I got that down. But the so history. If, any, if anybody comes up with something else or purchase something else, they can just send you a, a text or anything. Yeah, email. or I'm sure he'll be able to wing it because I think we are a lot more connected than we thought. You know, the stuff that he was telling me about the that I was really confused about. Like you said, Cindy, where depending on which census you're looking at, my family's from Austria, or it's from Hungary, or it's from Prussia, or it's from yeah, you yeah, know, Austria and Hungary, and early so. Slovenia. But when it gets down to it, you can see that, and they ask you what language they speak, they would say Slovenian. So, right. I mean, nobody ever said Russian or anything like that, and so it was. It's hard to look for documents because when you're trying to say where are they from, it, it kind of depends which document we're looking at because it could say any yeah. many things. It could say. But the story was that my father, my grandfather, Frank, had come to America in his 20s or so, and that he was already speaking multiple languages and that he'd already served in a war in the army. And it was very harsh conditions. And I know he came over and there's two other brothers. I don't know who came first because we can't find the immigrations for these people and the dates keep changing. So... And when I asked him that, they answer, he said, you know, that they, they were, that whole area over there was just one big, owned by Austria, I guess, Austria, -Hungar Austria -Hungarian, Austria -Hungarian. Hungarian, yeah, and so they all were kind of under the same king, so, even though they're very different peoples, yeah, and the yeah. very different languages, and I know that, I think where my family's from in Slovenia, um, Trieste, Trieste, Trest, the border shifted all the time depending on the war so they could be in they could be in Slovenia or they could be in Italy yeah they're not they that far from Venice up there there was all kinds of different yeah, yeah issues of which country it was and so uh, are you talking like Trieste Italy yeah yeah no oh. not Trieste no not Trieste it's in Slovenia now it's Slovenia but it's, yeah it's way up there on the top of the Adriatic it's close to Italy yeah right by Venice so it was owned by Italy for a while and then it's also been owned by Slovenia and then the Russian the then the the then it, I always knew when I was growing up it was Yugoslavia yeah that confused things even worse because then I think it was Yugoslavia by the time my my family came to America because I can remember seeing Yugoslavian written on things, or maybe by the 1920s. Hmm. I can remember because they'd always write it with a J, J yeah. U S L A B I A, and I always think 
wow, why do you spell with a J? I've always seen it with Y. Well, Croatia used to be part of Yugoslavia. Oh yeah, Yugoslavia yeah. had all those, yeah. all those. So is there, I don't know if, if you were here when I mentioned it, but do, have you ever watched Lydia's Kitchen, the cooking, the Italian cooking show on PBS? I think I lady, think maybe Lydia. Lydia I know who she is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she grew up thinking she was Italian and she cooks with her grandmother and she makes all these this Italian food. Yeah. She's Slovenian. <laughs> they were on the like west or east of Triste, left when the war was coming, went over into Italy, changed their last name to an Italian name and started acting like Italians because then they could live. And she finds out she's not Italian. I mean, she's like Italian cook and all this. Yeah. She's Slovenian, yeah. I mean, she's, she has like an Italian accent. Right, because she grew up speaking Italian, but they weren't Italian. They were Slovenian. They Slovenian like, at she all? was like three or something when they mm. fled to Italy and assumed okay. Italian personas. And it's like, that's culturally, she's Italian. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Finds out really, no, we're Slovenian. A very different. Yeah, this was a better place to be. But yeah, see, this is yeah. what I was thinking when yeah. Susan is talking about, you know, changing the, I'm just like, this sounds so stressful to be living in those, the, that at that time, you know, yeah, with such upheaval. But the craziness is, is, you know, we're so huge as the U.S., but imagine we were, had countries the size of, of Europe across the continent. You would have people that are fleeing the dust, dust Bowl in Oklahoma to come over to California to be able to survive and work. So now they're like Slovenians going to France, right? Yeah. It's just that we're all one big, but it's that same sort of, it's wild. Yeah, my family came here and they completely lost their culture. In a lot of ways, they didn't even know what their name was. Remember, right. I ran into all those cousins of mine who were much older than I am. That swore we were German. Yeah, <laughs> you know, my my father would have had a freaking fit. You know, German, yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. German, but where he where he was raised in 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 Cleveland is a huge melting pot of Slovenians. It's biggest group of people from Slovenia are in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's, my dad told me that there'd be neighborhoods, there'd be neighborhoods of Hungarians, neighboring for Croatians, a neighborhood of uh, Poles from like Poland. Pittsburgh. And they all had their own language, they all had their own food, and they all had their own culture and, you know, their own church over there. And, and, but when I looked at the census maps and stuff, I didn't see that when I was looking through the the maps and looking to see where people were from in 1900, 1920, 1910, there was no, I didn't see any division. You would see people that say Russian and then it would say Polish. So it was all mixed up. Hungarian. Yeah, it was all, they were all mixed up in the census uh, neighborhoods. But my dad told me, oh no, we were, they were little countries, little, little areas, yeah. neighborhoods of, of one language. And that's all they spoke. You went to the store, you spoke Slovenian. He had a really, really good friend who was Hungarian. And that was like going over to another neighborhood. Wow. <laughs> it was a big deal. But, you know, that's how it was when he was raised. Totally um, little countries in each, in each of these neighborhoods. Yeah. And I think it's still that way in a lot of ways over there. Uh, Pittsburgh is that way. Is it? Oh, yeah. All these little, mostly East European but Polish, Russian, you know, Lithuanian, all these different little pockets. We're gaining their, keeping their speak the language and restaurants and markets. Language. And you know. I think that it's, thank goodness though, because in a lot of ways, I feel like we're becoming very homogenized, you know, as far as Europe, because we don't have the immigrants from there, like, right. So many yeah, I don't know anything now about we... those languages or anything. Yeah, it's... well, it influences everything. It influences food. It influences mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, everything. Very interesting. Gardening, in our history. Yeah. yeah, I got a degree in history. Never did anything with it. <laughs> oh, you are now. I okay, am now. so okay. it's come up on three thirty. Okay, yeah, so we should sign so up. We should probably wrap it up. So next week, Caspian's going to do something. And then 
Um, yay. And then, Deirdre, you think about what, when you want to do it um, okay. again. I, yeah, not, not soon. <laughs> Was very okay, well, I just thought you had, no, I thought you had more. That you I, I really liked well, it. I could have, and I want to be super prepared. Okay, but the, well, you were definitely the brony, prepared. The brony was it. so interesting. Hey, if you find a, if somebody figure out if there's a brony equivalent for a female. Is that what okay, well, I, I look back on my notes and they didn't, they didn't, they didn't delineate, you know, whether it was male or female. We we got it off of whatever you read that it was male. But so it could have been female. Baroni. Benoni. Benoni. You could you would could find a Benoni female. So was it the translation "Son of Sorrow"? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's where it was. Well, then. there might be a Birona. No, there might be a female something though. Well, anyway. Somebody so figure it out. Next week we're that. Um, I'm thinking I might do an Irish one here soon. I don't know when exactly, because um, Jenna's interested. I know Tampley has Irish. Susan, does your people go back to Irish on your mother's side? Well, they might, but I've never found it. I'm, I'm okay. from on Scotland. Well, I I don't know. Um, where else did that, who else did it come up with? Anyway, it did occur to me, even though Deirdre and Mary don't, their husbands are, Oh, Grady. Do. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Grady. And, and of course, Sean has, you know, Pat's ancestry. So it, at least you could relate to it. Oh, definitely. You, could, you know, so I might do that, but we'll think about it. I don't want to get myself too stressed out trying to. Don't stress about it. Things. So, um, but I, you know, I don't know what else. After, after casting, we'll have to figure out what's who's going to do what next. Something will occur to us. I do. I am think I'm going to sign up for that um, the Southern California Genealogy Society conference. That it's a two weekend thing. One is DNA, the other is general genealogy. I think I will sign up for the DNA one because it does look like some. Um, new kinds of things. And um, the day is, I don't know, five speakers or something. And then there's, you can pick 10 or 20 and you have until October 3rd to see those broadcasts. So I could spread that out. So I guess what I'm trying to swing around to is that maybe that the Thursday after that, I could give a report about some of the stuff I learned. So that would be Second, third. That I would, would be like to hear second. the D, more DNA stuff. Yeah. Hey, just on the off chance, I looked up Benoni. Is that my saying it right? On Wikipedia, Benoni, Benoni yeah. on the a disambiguation page, and there's a bunch of people who are first name. That's their first name. You know, it's got like a little list of people, and they're all seem to be 1800s. Are they male or female? 1700s, some 1600s. Just people who were famous, who's, that's their name. And I, I'll take a look at it and see. They look like they're all, I can't tell, but I think they're all male. Well, mm -hmm. they ages are probably male from that far back. Because, of course, women never did anything in the 1700s to be known for, right? We weren't even around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but I wonder if there's going to be anything, references into these stories about why they, where they got their name. Hey Susan, mm -hmm. quick question: Is the um, is the Zoom code and password the same every week? Yeah. Okay, I just caught on to that. <laughs> I will. Yay, Tamberly! Yeah, well, Tamberly evidently is a old Gaelic for slow one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice either. <laughs> <Tamberley. laughs> That's always the same. Cindy always calls me on Wednesday, and I answer the phone. And I think. Oh, it's Wednesday. <laughs> Cindy's name pop up on my phone. It says, it says, call from Cindy. I'm like, oh, it's Wednesday. <laughs> I always do. We have a little house time kind of doing it. Kind of make sure what's going on. And then she said, I appreciate you put the link doing that, button. Susan. It, yeah, it's so, you know, one less technical thing I have to try and see. I have so. to say, I just looked, I put Benoni in Google Translate and it, just translate to Benoni, but they it said it was Dutch. Huh. Dutch. 
Well, the other thing said Hebrew. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't see how it's Dutch. Yeah. I think Benoni sounds much more Hebrew than. There's another. Yeah, there's a guy. I found, his name is Benoni Irwin. He was born in 1840, and his parents were Quakers, originally from the Scottish borders. Wow, this is just really weird. <laughs> and it's like covering all ethnicities now. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if, if this will go to some kind of something like somebody. So, I'm, I'm really curious they're going to say, and his mother died in childbirth with him. Well, so not not being versed in the Bible at all. Is there something with Rachel's son Benjamin that is sorrowful? Yeah. What? Um, there's Rachel something. was the one who she couldn't have a baby. I mean, was she, she had a child, so he's on her. Right. Which one? I, wasn't Ben Benjamin with the father Isaac, and he or not Benjamin? No, no. Oh, yeah, it. yes, yes. But it was Isaac's son, and he something about Rebecca. She, there were tears. Maybe she she died young or Rebecca. Was, this isn't the one where uh, he got tricked. Abraham, 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 the Isaac that I'm thinking. Where he got tricked into marrying the other woman. Oh, the sister, the youngest sister. He got yeah. church into marrying the oldest sister. Uh, yeah, that, that's with the male and everything. Was it Rebecca and Leah? No, that's. I don't know the Bible. No, that's Rachel and Leah. Let's see. Which is the one that had. So Rachel was the daughter. Uh, wait, Rachel was the wife of Isaac. And she. Was she? Had two sons. Yes. And they were. Oh, wait. No. Esau. No. And. I think I have the Rebecca, I'm looking, well, it's Wikipedia, but she is the wife of Isaac and the mother of Jacob and Esau. Oh. I just said that. Okay. I got go. my, I got, I remember my Bible. And Good so job. Esau was the one who was very, very smooth. And the other one was very rough, the brothers. And so whenever their father was dying, Esau. the mother snuck the child in to get the, to have Esau get the, or maybe it's the other way around to get the father's what's it called blessing blessing and the money and the inheritance and what she did is she put like hairy stuff on the kid's arm well he was an adult or a teenager and so the father who was blind reached out and he thought he was talking to the other son so she tricked her her son to get the inheritance and not the other woman's son because they were like uh half brothers and so they they did that Isaac, uh, Jacob and Esau. Yeah, the story of Jacob and Esau. So it's like and Jacob been would have been Joseph's father. Hmm? Coat of many colors, Jacob, right? With all the sons. He had all those different uh, Joseph yeah. many colors. Yeah. Coat right. of many colors that went and had all I mean, the different. It's a musical, I know. Of, well, it's different. Uh, yeah, Jacob had Joseph in many colors. Right. And yeah. Benjamin was one of jo Jacob's brothers. Boy, this is really going way back for me i'm having to think <laughs> i mean i knew all of this but now i'm like uh but if benjamin was the fate no joseph was no, i think you, they're no. getting yeah maybe I'm confused have to look that up because if it's somehow linked to benjamin there must be some sort of sorrow that's linked to benjamin he would have been the youngest i think of the 12 well, died at his birth all right i'm out of here okay. all right all righty. Good to see you guys. See you next week. I see you. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good the job. There. Look at it. We learned a lot. Oh, you're welcome.